<laughs> All right. So even though Brand's not here, he's gone ahead and left us in some very capable hands with uh, Mr. Eric James Stone. <laughs> Quick bit of introduction, Eric started his creative writing pastime when he was in college working on his bachelor's degree in it was political science, wasn't it? Political science. And in 2003, after attending Orson Scott Card's literary boot camp, he began working even harder on it to the point that he then placed as a published finalist in Writers of the Future in 2004, and in 2005 then won Writers of the Future with his story, Betrayer of Trees. And winning Rise of the Future is not very easy. They have thousands upon thousands of applicants of very good writers, so it's a very big accomplishment to simply be able to do that. Subsequent years since, Eric's been published probably over, how many short stories? Over 30. Well, yeah, over 30 short stories and stuff, such as Analog, Daily SF, uh, Nature, Orson's Got Cards, Intergalactic Messenger Show, where Eric currently is an assistant editor. Yep. Assistant editor with that. But in 2011, his career really took off when his story, That Leviathan Whom Thou Hast Made, which is a really awesome title, I gotta say, won the Nebula Award and was nominated for a Hugo Award. There's the Nebula right there. <laughs> <laughs> and was nominated for a Hugo Award, which I totally think it still should have won because it was an awesome story and it blew my mind and everyone should read it. <laughs> so, won that. That success, combined with his release of his ebook, Unforgettable, led to him being signed with Joshua Billmas, who, as Eric already mentioned, is also Brandon's agent. So that's Eric in a nutshell. So I'm going to go ahead and stop talking about how awesome he is, and I'm going to go ahead and let him prove it. <laughs> also, I'm going to be passing out these tickets. If you could please just take one of them and pass the other one up, preferably the bottom one. That helped me a lot. Yeah, I'm going to be giving away, I think I have 15 books or magazines to give away. Sorry I don't have enough for everyone, but I figured this was the fairest way to do it uh, with a drawing. Um, also, I'm going to be passing around this, so if you want to sign up for my email list so you can get notification of when I've got new stuff coming out, you can put your email address on there. I promise not to spam you too much. All right, yeah, as, uh, as Colton, you know, he, he gave you pretty much a, an introduction to me, but I thought I'd talk about how I, you know, got into writing, how I got into starting publishing, uh, and, and things like that. Uh, then I'm going to talk a bit about short story writing and how it's different from novel writing, um, because obviously short story writing is a thing I have some expertise in. Um, and then I will open it up for questions, and I figure that'll take most of the time because uh, I want to talk about what you want to hear about. So, um, so yeah, back in 1989, I was taking creative writing here at BYU, the science fiction and fantasy section, uh, from Marion Doc Smith, who you may have heard of. Um, and I wrote some stuff, and I you know, thought one of the stories was actually pretty good, and maybe I ought to try to get it published. And so I submitted it to a magazine, and it got rejected. And I submitted to the Writers of the Future contest, and it got rejected. And so I basically said, well, I guess I'm not that good of a writer, so I'm not even going to bother anymore. So I quit writing for over 10 years. Big mistake. <laughs> um, uh, when I say I quit writing, I quit creative writing. Now, I, during that time, I went to law school. I ended up getting a job for a nonprofit in Washington, DC, and I did a lot of writing for them. I wrote op-eds, uh, research papers, and things like that. Things that placed a, a premium on clarity in your writing uh, and uh, conciseness. And so I, you know, I was still doing a lot of writing, I just wasn't writing fiction. Um, well, some of my op-eds, that's deb deb debatable. But, um, <laughs> and uh, so, so then in uh, 2002, for some unknown reason, 
I got a sudden desire to write an epic fantasy novel. Um, and so now the longest thing I had ever written uh, in terms of fiction was a 4,000 word short story that I wrote at, here at BYU. Um, and I always thought, well, how on earth can anyone ever write a novel? Because every idea I have, the story is done in you know, 4,000 words or less. And then I got this novel idea, and I thought about it, thought about it for a while, thought about different things that could happen in the novel. And finally, I decided, OK, I'm going to start writing it. So I sat down, and over the course of two nights, I wrote a 7,000-word prologue. Um, since cut down to about 3,000 words. But, uh, <laughs> but um, I decided, OK, well, I don't know how good this is. And if I'm going to be serious about writing, I need to work on improving my craft. So I signed up for a community education uh, creative writing class um, and went to that. And through that class, I started working on my craft. The teacher would assign craft writing exercises. And now uh, his focus wasn't on science fiction and fantasy, but fortunately, he was tolerant of it. Um, and I would take his assignment and generally put a science fiction or fantasy spin on it. And uh, so, for example, one of the assignments was write about two people who have opposite personalities but are still friends. And so I started thinking about, well, what about somebody who has a really fast la lifestyle and someone who has a really slow lifestyle? And I ended up writing a phone conversation between two friends, one of whom has had his mind uploaded into a computer. Um, and over the course of the years, as the computer keeps getting upgraded and runs faster and faster, his life runs faster and faster. So that at the, uh, by the, the time they're talking, uh, about, uh, about a year passes inside the computer when only a day passes outside. Um, so that, you know, that's how I fulfilled that assignment. And my teacher said, wow, this is really good. You ought to submit it as a short story. You know, because while you're working on your novel, you can get your name out there with short stories. And I'm like, huh, maybe I should do that. I looked at that assignment and decided, well, it's not really a complete short story. And I, so I came up with more of a conflict, extended it out, and uh, that ended up being my first sale in memory, which uh, ended up being a published finalist in the Writers of the Future contest. Um, so from there, I you know, started selling more and more short fiction. Um, I've actually lost count now. There was a while when I, I could tell you just right off the top of my head how many stories I had published. Um, and I remember having dinner with Orson Scott Card, and he said, well, how many have you published so far? And I ha knew the number right off, and he said, yeah, well, it's better when you don't remember anymore. Um, so um, let's see. So yeah, so basically, I, I started writing more and more sh short fiction while working on the novel, eventually while working on a second novel. Um, and I kept submitting. And uh, fortunately, I found there were several editors who actually liked my style of writing and the kinds of things I wrote about. And so I sell pretty consistently to them. Uh, so Analog Magazine and Intergalactic Medicine Show um, and Daily Science Fiction uh, all have bought at least seven stories from me. Um, and then there are other places where I've managed to, to sell one or two stories um, as well. Um, and then, of course, I was working on my novel. I finished my first novel. I sent out queries for it. Uh, that this was the epic fantasy and wasn't able to find anybody who was really interested. I did get a couple of requests for the full, but they ended up rejecting it. And um, then I wrote a second novel uh, that was a science fiction thriller, and it was only about 62,000 words. I managed to get it up to about 67,000 words after revising it. But 
pretty much every agent that I approached about it said, well, it's just not long enough. You know, uh, and so, and I really didn't know how to lengthen it. Um, so I decided uh, basically that uh, it wasn't going to, it wasn't going to sell. And so I thought, well, you know, this whole e-publishing revolution is happening. Uh, and so I decided to self-publish it on, on Amazon and uh, Barnes and Noble for, for the Kindle and Nook and see what happened. I also decided to serialize it on my website to kind of build up some publicity. And not much happened with it. I sold maybe 80 or 90 copies over the course of a couple of months. Um, and this was after I had been nominated for the Nebula Award. Um, so it wasn't a lot of publicity from that, getting out, wanting, getting people to want to buy my book. Um, so in terms of the e-publishing revolution, I'm still not totally sold on that. I'm, I do sell a, a lot of my short stories as you know, 99 cents, and I offer them actually for, you know, for, for free on select days through Kindle's program. So today, actually, in memory, my first story ever is the one that's available for free for Kindle. Um, so, uh, so then I got nominated for the Nebula, which was, of course, a huge honor. Um, and I really had no, no, I really didn't think I was going to win it. I was, and so when they announced that I had won, I was really totally, totally taken aback uh, and shocked by that. Um, and one of the main reasons why I didn't think it had much of a chance and why I was kind of astonished that it had gotten nominated is because it's a very Mormon story. The main character is a, a Mormon branch president uh, for a branch on a space station in the middle of the sun. Um, in the sun? In the sun, yes. Um, and he has some members of his branch who are uh, of a species called swales, essentially plasma beings that are kind of like whales inside the sun. Um, How do you baptize them? <laughs> ah, that's an excellent question. Um, and, and the answer is you don't. They don't have to be baptized because, um, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, uh, you know, that uh, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. But swales, not being men, are not subject to that requirement. <laughs> uh, so, uh, is, that yeah, the, I, is that the in every story? What story? Is no, that is that Leviathan whom thou hast made. So. Um, yeah, it was published in Analog Magazine, which is a hard science fiction magazine. Uh, it, w it absolutely thrilled me that a story with a believing religious character could end up in a magazine like Analog. Um, because there's kind of a reputation, the, the, uh, the editor is, is an atheist, and he ha kind of has a reputation for not liking religious stories. Um, and uh, so I, I, that's why you know, it was a real validation to me that it could be published there when the main character is a believing Mormon and you know, remains so throughout the whole thing and is not some you know, crazy, whacked out religious nut, um, which is how religious people sometimes end up being portrayed in science fiction. Now, I knew that Analog did occasionally publish stories with s strong religious characters in them because uh, Michael Burstein, who's an Orthodox Jew, uh, had a story called Sanctuary published in there about a Roman Catholic priest uh, who was a believer, and you know, so so I knew that it was possible, but it's you know, it's a hard sell to the editor. Uh, but um, let me talk a bit about how I ended up writing that story because it's the most Mormon story I've ever written, with the exception of. Uh, short little one that I just gave to UVU's uh, 
uh, science fiction and fantasy magazine because a friend of mine was an editor there and he said, please, please give me something that is actually good so that we can publish it. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, their, their science fiction magazine is nowhere near as good as the leading edge here at BYU. Uh, but anyway, so I was at a workshop in Oregon taught by uh, Dean Wesley Smith and Christine Catherine Rush um, and also by Sheila Williams, who's the editor of Asimov's magazine. And while there, I, you know, we had to write a, a story uh, based off the prompt that they gave us. And they did this little exercise where we came up with a character, um, and I don't even remember what that character was, but, and we came up with a, a setting, and somebody suggested the middle of the sun, and so, okay, and came up with a problem that was being faced by the character, and the problem was, can't get a date. Um, and then, after we'd gone through that exercise, they said, yeah, now actually just forget about the character that we came up with, and instead write the story with you as the main character, a main character based on you. And so I thought about it, and I'm like, well, you know, um, one of my major defining characteristics is I'm Mormon, so I'll write about a Mormon in the middle of the sun who can't get a date. <laughs> um, and that's where that story started from. Um, and the assignment was to write a complete story uh, that weekend, and I failed. Um, I, I only wrote, I, I wrote about 2,000 words, and I put an ending on it. <laughs> um, and uh, my friends who were there who read it said, yeah, this is really good. Uh, I want to read the next 5,000 words. <laughs> Uh, so after I got back from the workshop, I thought about how I could develop the conflict more and create, and basically I just extended off from that beginning that I had written uh, and wrote the rest of it. And uh, I thought, hey, it's pretty good. Uh, and I ran it past some non-Mormons to see if they understood the Mormon stuff in it enough that it wasn't too hard to comprehend if you weren't a Mormon, and they said, no, it's fine. So I sent it off, and it ended up getting published. Uh, and then, you know, it got nominated, and then it won. And I mean, I'm still, you know, kind of flabbergasted by it all. Now, one of the interesting things that happened because of that was, you know, it got nominated for the Nebula, got nominated for the Hugo, now, I had, I had submitted my second novel, the science fiction thriller, to Joshua Bilmus, and he had handed it off to one of his assistant agents. And that agent had uh, read the, you know, the first few chapters and synopsis and basically said, well, not ready to represent it now. I'm, you know, if you make some changes, we might look at it again. I'll give you some feedback on what changes you might make. And that was in 2009. And I touched base a couple of times. The assistant was obviously just way too busy to get that feedback to me. And so I figured, well, you know, they, they were basically giving me feedback just out of courtesy to Brandon, because I'm a friend of his. And so uh, I'm not going to bug him about it. Um, so after I got nominated, nominated for the Nebula and the Hugo, I suddenly got an email from the assistant who said, sorry for dropping off the face of the earth like that, but um, Joshua just read the material you sent us on Unforgettable, and uh, he was wondering if we could see the whole novel. And so I said, well, um, sure, I can send you the whole novel, but I've started serializing it on my website, and I've already made it available on Kindle and Nook, so I understand if that means you know you're no longer interested because that you know can cause problems with trying to sell it. And they emailed back, no, we're still interested. So I sent it off, and uh, a few days before the Nebula Awards, Joshua called me and said, hey, I'd like to meet with you at the Nebulas, uh, you know, to talk about Unforgettable. So I met him for breakfast the day before the Nebulas. 
And he said, well, you know, I've read it, I like it, uh, you know, as a concept, but it needs some work, it needs to be longer, some things need to be changed in it. Um, but if you make some changes, I'd be willing to look at it again. Okay. So that's kind of what I had figured he was going to say. But um, Then the Monday after I won the Nebula Award, I got an email from Joshua, and he said, it strikes me that as is, it's good enough to pitch to Hollywood as a movie idea. Would you mind, I'm meeting with some Hollywood agents this week, would you mind if I pitched it to them? Uh, okay. Uh, so he then called me and said that one of the agents really liked it uh, and wanted to read the whole novel and really liked the pitch and wanted to read the whole novel. So they were sending it to him that next weekend. And the next week, Joshua called and said, yeah, Joel, the Hollywood agent, uh, really thinks we can sell this. So I want to represent you. Um, <laughs> So that's how I got an agent. Um, and so because I now had an agent, I pulled it down off the novel down off of Nook and Kindle and, and my website. Um, and over the course of negotiations, uh, they ended up selling the TV rights to Lionsgate Entertainment. Um, and so they, they sold an option. Uh, Chances are it won't actually get made. But hey, I made more money off of that than I had ever made you know, in a single year off, off my writing before. Um, and, uh, and if they do make it, then that's going to be really great. Mm -hmm. um, but my, I've been told by a lot of authors the attitude toward Hollywood stuff basically is take the money and run. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, so... Um, so yeah, that's basically how that all developed. I've heard a lot of people say that essentially no two people's careers follow the same path. I mean, it's highly unli unlikely that any of you will follow the exact same path that I did to, to my success in writing. Um, but the important thing is you keep working at it and keep working to improve your craft and keep working to try to get things published. And that's where things start to happen. So, um, so yeah, I think that basically covers what I wanted to talk about in terms of career. Oh, yeah, I brought this for show and tell. Um, you've heard show, don't tell. Well, I like to show and tell. <laughs> um, so yeah, these are all of my print publications. Um, and it, that includes translations into Russian um, for some of my short stories, uh, translation into Hebrew uh, for one of my stories. Um, and now Nature is a, a scientific journal. Um, and according to Nature, uh, I am the author of the greatest science fiction story ever written. <laughs> because that is the title of my short story that they published. <laughs> but I like to phrase it as if it was, they were passing judgment on the story. Um, but, uh, yeah, this actually there are some print publications that I still haven't gotten a hold of yet. I've been published in Italian and uh, just last month in Chinese. Um, so uh, hopefully I will get a hold of copies of those eventually. Um, let's see, what else did I want to talk about? Uh, oh, yes. And last year, um, a publisher decided to put out a collection of my short stories. Uh, so there are 25 stories in here, one of which was never published elsewhere. All the rest were published elsewhere before. So, All right, now I want to talk a bit about um, short fiction as opposed to long fiction. Yes, I was wondering if you want to go into that. 
I'm, I'm just curious, when did you start becoming a full-time writer? I'm not a full-time writer. I, I have a day job as a web developer right now. Um, short fiction does not pay enough to uh, work full-time. Um, I mean, even if you could write enough stories that if you sold them at professional rates, you, uh, you could make a living off it, there aren't enough places buying them at professional rates for you to sell that many stories in a year. Uh, you know, unless you were writing under several pseudonyms and you were writing stuff that was so much better than anybody else's that the publications just had to buy. Um, Jay Lake uh, is one of the most prolific short story writers I know um, and he does not make enough at short fiction to, to live off of. So yeah, short fiction is not a way to make a living. Um, uh, <clears throat> maybe if electronic publishing takes off enough and you know, various things happen, some people will manage to do it. But right now, nobody is making a living writing short fiction. Um, short fiction, there are essentially two reasons to write it. One is um, you enjoy doing it. It's something you like. Um, and the other is, <coughs> OK, there are three reasons. Um, <laughs> second is to practice your craft. And the third is to essentially um, make a name for yourself. Um, that third one has you know, obviously worked for me. Uh, that's how I ended up getting an agent was because of my short fiction and then getting known for my short fiction. Um, if it hadn't been for the Nebula Award, Joshua would not have ended up re representing me. Um, so, uh, and of course, not everybody wins awards. Uh, but short fiction gives you a chance to practice your craft, get better at storytelling, um, and uh, it doesn't take as long to write as to write a novel, <laughs> obviously. And so that can give you practice in things like uh, figuring out an overall story <coughs> arc, figuring out how to make a powerful <coughs> ending, uh, figuring out how to introduce characters, uh, and figuring out how to write scenes and things like that. So a lot of, a lot of the things that work for short fiction, those skills can be transferred to long fiction. Writing snappy dialogue, for instance. You know, if you can write it in short fiction, you can write it in long fiction as well. Um, there are some things, however, that long fiction is very different. First of all, it's a lot longer. Um, uh, and that means it needs to be more complex. Um, you can write a short story that has a very straight line sort of plot that's, uh, that you know, because uh, people are not expecting the kind of complexity that you get in a in a novel. If you write a novel with a straight line plot, you'd be you have to be very very good at character or setting or some something else to to you know make up for the fact that your plot really isn't all that interesting. Um, but short fiction allows you to do some things that you can't do uh, at novel length, or at least people don't enjoy at novel length. Um, you can do a lot, of, a lot more experimental stuff in, in short fiction than you can in long fiction to try things out, see, see how they go. Um, for instance, I, one of my short stories that was published in Daily Science Fiction, um, I think it was about 800 words long. Um, and it's told completely in words of one syllable. Now, if you tried to write a novel uh, completely in words of one syllable, that's going to get old pretty quick. Um, but uh, for a short story, it worked. Um, and so, yeah, it gives you more chances to experiment with things that 
at novel length might become overwhelming. Um, now, what are the secrets to writing short fiction? Because there are a lot of people who have trouble writing short. I have trouble writing long, for the most part. Um, not with my epic fantasy, which ended up 150,000 words, uh, and I cut it down a bit. Um, and which, you know, it, but with my, my, with Unforgettable, yeah, it ended up too short because I wasn't really sure how to write long. Um, uh, there are different lengths of short fiction, uh, and at, the shorter it is, the more you need to essentially use shortcuts. For instance, on the back of the business card, I don't know how many of you have read that short story yet, um, but you know, to have a short story this short, that's you have to use a lot of shortcuts. That's the whole short story. This is the entire short story. Um, but you know, this one starts at the end of the story uh, because you know it's essentially relying on a lot of things that people already know, kind of science fiction cliches like. There's a, a galactic empire out there. You know, uh, there are other races out there, at, and humanity wanting to gain admission to the, the races that have space flight. That's kind of an accepted uh, trope in science fiction, and the idea that it's your first interstellar flight that you know qualifies you for possible membership in the com community of the galaxy. That's a standard as well. Um, but there's also the cliche that, oh, humans are such a violent species and that advanced civilizations will be peaceful. Well, you know, I put a twist on that. Um, uh, but it's, this story is basically relying on people being familiar with a lot of the tropes that are, have been used a lot in science fiction. Um, and without those, it would this story really wouldn't work too well. Um, I have another back of the business card short story that was on my previous version of my business card uh, that uh, was a three wishes story. But it starts with you know someone trying to decide what his third wish will be. It relies very much on the whole rubbing the lamp, genie comes out, gives you three witches stereotype that people are basically familiar with. And so I don't have to explain that, well, yes, when you rub a lamp, a magical lamp, a genie comes out, and a genie is this powerful magical being that can grant up to three wishes, but the wishes, all of that stuff you already know because you've seen Aladdin and... you know. Uh, so uh, with short fiction, often you rely on established tropes to give you shortcuts for a lot of things. A lot of things. And that, that's, that's why world building in short fiction cannot be as extensive as uh, it can be in novels. Um, for uh, That Leviathan Whom Thou Hast Made, I was relying to a great, to great extent on people being familiar with a lot of science fiction ideas, like uh, alien life forms made out of plasma, uh, living in a star. You know, if you had to explain that to someone who had never read science fiction, they'd be, huh? But the concept of alien life is very familiar. Uh, the concept of Plasma beings is not unfamiliar to most readers. Um, and uh, the concept of uh, some sort of shield, force shield around this, this station that protects it from the sun. I don't have to go into detail about you know, force fields and how force fields work and things like that. Um, you know, and when I talk about a uh, a shuttle as a, something that's moving through space. I don't have to explain that because most of these things are familiar to, to people who have read science fiction. Um, 
so yeah, using shortcuts where, uh, and stereotypes to, you know, of course you don't want your character to be pure stereotype, but by drawing on a stereotype, you allow the reader to fill in a bunch of non-essential information about the character, um, and you just kind of show how your character differs from the stereotype to fill in the important information. Um, other things about keeping stories short, the more characters you have, the harder it is to keep the story short. Um, and so uh, you tend to want to focus just on a few characters um, in your short fiction uh, rather than cast of thousands. The more scenes you have, the more difficult it is to, to keep a story short. I do have one short story I sold that had nine scenes in a thousand words. Um, but that's generally the exception rather than the rule. Um, so c keeping, keeping down the number of characters, keeping down the number of scenes, keeping down the number of locations, uh, keeping down the number of plots. Um, when, uh, that for that story that had nine scenes in it in a, in a thousand words, actually 950 words, it started out at 1950 words, and then I found out that there was a thousand word limit for the uh, target market that I w was writing it for. So I had to cut, I cut a thousand words, just over half of the words in that story. It meant cutting out a subplot <laughs> that I had in there, um, and, uh, you know, cutting out some characters. There had originally been three characters, now there were only two. Um, and cu cutting down and combining scenes and, and things like that. And so, yeah, uh, basically fewer characters, fewer plots, fewer settings, that's the secret to short fiction. Um, try to make it as powerful as you can by focusing on essentially the most important point in the story. Um, and uh, that getting into the story late, as close to the climax as possible, uh, you know, while still setting everything up that you need to, allows you to keep it shorter. So, all right, I think now I'll open it up for questions and you can ask anything you want. Yes? I've heard a little bit of science fiction dealing with Mormons that it's a little bit more edgy about stuff relating to the church, things that you know you don't necessarily want to talk about, but I really liked Leviathan because it treated all of these different things about the church in a very real way, but also in a very respectful way, and it didn't detract from the story to do that. How did you work that into your writing process? Well, um, basically, I work I work that into my writing process by saying, okay, I mean, the character is based on me. The character also has quite a few differences from me. Uh, but the, the, the key thing is I basically wanted him to treat relig our religion the way that I do. Um, and since I respect, uh, respect it, that's the way the character treated it. Um, and I... I knew I was writing for a non-Mormon audience, and so I wanted to, you know, I, I needed to explain some things for that, but I wanted to do it in a matter, not, not really, a, I didn't want to apologize for anything. I just wanted to say, this is the way this character believes. Uh, and, and, um, and in order to provide some, um, essentially a, a, a way to explain some of the things. Um, I had a, an atheist character in there to kind of provide a, a counterpoint on, on things. Um, and yeah, she expresses some disrespect for, uh, for the religion, but the, the main character is unfazed by that and essentially he continues to believe what he believes. Um, 
And um, yeah, so basically trying to, to write it the way I would want to read about Mormonism. Because I've read some science fiction that involves Mormons, and most of the time I'm like, well, you don't really get Mormons. Uh, you don't understand us. You're, so you, you can't, you're not really writing about Mormons. You're writing about some figment of your imagination of what you think about Mormons. I'll, I will say Robert Heinlein, every mention of Mormons that he made, I thought was respectful. Um, and I really appreciated that uh, from him. Um, so, other questions? Yes? What exactly is your writing process start to finish for a short story? Like, how long does it take? What sort of things do you do? Yeah, it varies a lot. Um, I've I've done I've done several workshops where I had to write a short story at the workshop, and uh, actually the one where I started Leviathan was the only time I've actually failed to write a complete short story during during the twenty four hour period. Um, generally, I I have to come up with an idea that ha presents some sort of conflict. Um, and then I just kind of think, okay, where would it start? And I have to have a pretty good idea of where it would end. And then I just sit down and start writing it. Um, sometimes I will outline. Um, the story that I think is the best one I've written, uh, The Robot Sorcerer, um, I actually outlined it and wrote parts of it out of order. Um, I was, you know, writing it uh, kind of on a deadline, and I figured, okay, well, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna skimp on parts, it won't be the end. I'll skimp on the middle, um, and so I ended up writing the final scene uh, and the climax uh, before I wrote some of the middle scenes. Um, but and so having an outline allowed me to do that because I just skipped ahead in my outline and, and wrote the, the scenes. So, um, I think we'll see that. Um, but sometimes I don't know where a short story is going to end. I would never, okay, I won't say I would never write a novel, but I will never finish a novel where I didn't know where it was going because I've started some novels where I didn't know how it was going to end and it bogged down pretty quick and, and I haven't gotten anywhere on them. So, uh, but short stories I can sometimes write without knowing how it's going to end and then I, in that case, I tend to find things that I've, put in earlier in the story without no, realizing why they would become important at the end and tie them in to, to make it all work. Um, you can also g do kind of the reverse of that and having come to the end say, oh, well, I should put this in earlier on to, to make it work. Um, but yeah, my, my process for writing short stories uh, varies a bit depending on the idea itself and how I feel I need to, to approach writing it. Someone else had a question, yeah. Yeah, um, what, what is the quality that makes a good ending and is there an example of an ending that captures that idea? Um, one of the... Um, one of the things I learned at the Odyssey workshop, which is a six week long workshop um, that I attended, it's held up in New Hampshire. Um, and it's an absolutely fantastic experience. If you ever get a chance to go to it, go. Um, I used to wonder how do people go to six week long writing workshops like Odyssey or Clarion. Uh, I thought I would never have the time to do one of those. And then I got laid off from work three days before the deadline to apply to Odyssey. 
<laughs> so I was like, I'm going to Odyssey. <laughs> but um, Jean Cabellos, who used to be an editor for one of the major publishers, is the main teacher at Odyssey. And um, she essentially uh, pointed out that one of the weaknesses in my fiction, because she'd read several of my stories, uh, was that my characters didn't really tie into my plots too much. I mean, yeah, my characters are there doing all the action in the plot, but the, the plot really wasn't all that meaningful to the character. Um, and I, I realized that, yeah, I tend to come up with this cool idea. Oh, it would be cool if this happened. But there wasn't a particular reason why it was this character rather than someone else. I just kind of randomly picked a person to, be, to move around and do the stuff in my plot. Um, and I would come up with, you know, <coughs> my, my idea for the, the, the climax of the story, and it didn't really matter who the character was because the climax was just resolving the problem. Um, and one of the, th the things she suggested was that I figure out what my character wanted most and figure out what my character feared the most um, and then create a situation where in order to solve that problem, the, the, the plot problem, the character has to face that fear um, and uh, essentially risk losing what he wants most. Um, and that conversation with Gene happened when I was working on the robot sorcerer. I'd written about 500 words into it. Um, and the basic concept for the robot sorcerer was, well, uh, what if, uh, you know, robot probe went through a wormhole and ended up in a magical world? Um, and I thought, oh yeah, it'll be kind of a fun little romp with this robot that suddenly becomes sentient and everyone thinks he's a wizard. You know? um, and uh, I had no real idea of how the plot was going to go, but it was just going to be a kind of a silly little plot. And um, then after talking with Jean about it, uh, you know, basically I realized, okay, I have to figure out what the robot fears and what the robot wants and put those into conflict. <clears throat> Um, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna spoil the story here, but I think it's worth reading even if you, <laughs> if you know the end. Um, the, the the first person that the robot encounters is this uh, uh, this girl who has been wishing uh, at this magical pond, and this robot comes out, and so she thinks the robot's there to fulfill her wish which is uh, she's got this silver band that on her head that she's had ever, ever since she was a kid, um, and it's starting to give her headaches, and so she wants to get rid of it. Um, and so the, the robot, uh, whose name is Merlin, it stands for Multi-Environment Robotic Lander with Intelligent Nav Navigation, um, uh, he has to clarify later to some of the characters, he's not THE Merlin. Uh, but um, anyway, he decides that what he wants to do is he wants to help this girl. Um, that's the, you know, he wants to help her get rid of this thing that is causing problems for her. Uh, when he does manage to cut through it um, and uh, take it off, it turns out it was something that was preventing her from being kind of a magical bomb absorbing magical energy and then spraying it out repeatedly. Um, and so she's captured by the local authorities and um, he is, Merlin is ordered to go back where he came from. Um, and so he's going back to the wormhole to go back to Earth and realizing that he will probably lose his sentience when he leaves the magical area. Uh, he suddenly realizes, well, wait a minute, you know, hey, I'm sentient now, I don't have to follow orders. I can choose for myself what I want to do. Um, and 
I don't want to go back to Earth and lose my sentience. So that's the thing he fears. And the thing he wants to do most is help this little girl, so he decides he has to go rescue her. Um, so he goes, crashes into the prison where she's being held, um, and he's figured out, he thinks, uh, he thinks he's figured out what it is that makes magic work. It's this strange vibration that he can detect in atoms. And he figures he can use his uh, nuclear resonance scanner to stop this strange vibration in the girl uh, and thereby turn her non-magical. And, there, you know, and then she won't be a bomb and she will, she will be safe. And so he, he tries that and it fails. Meanwhile, the authority, local authorities come in, has created a, a magical wormhole to take Merlin back to Earth. Um, and the girl tells him, no, no, go off, leave me, save yourself. Um, and so now we've got a climax where the robot can, you know, uh, avoid his greatest fear by abandoning the girl. Um, or he can try to accomplish what he really wants, which is to save the girl. And so he takes her through the wormhole back to Earth. Loses his sentience, but saves her. And that's, that's a pretty powerful ending, uh, if I do say so myself. Um, and uh, it, it's made powerful by essentially raising the stakes and putting the, the fear in there and the desire and putting those into conflict uh, while everything else is happening all around that. Um, so now there are other ways to make <coughs> powerful endings. Um, that's just one that I've found uh, as kind of a... I find that one powerful because it, sh it took, for the first time, I was using the character's desires to shape the plot rather than just plugging my character into the plot. Um, and uh, so, yeah, if you can use your, if you make it so that the, the ending, the climax is really important to your characters, um, I think that tends to make it more powerful. Um, now, when I'm, when I'm reading Slush for Intergalactic Medicine Show, the thing I hate the most is when I read a story, you know, it starts off, and oh, this is an interesting uh, situation here. Oh, these are interesting characters. Oh, this is exciting stuff that's happening. And we reach the end, and yeah, it just kind of fizzled out. Uh, because if, it was, if the story were boring and poorly written at the beginning, I don't have to read the whole thing. <laughs> But if the ending is bad, I've had to read the whole thing. Um, and I'd say the, the biggest problem with people's endings is that um, they don't feel satisfying. Satisfying doesn't necessarily mean happy. Um, but rather that uh, when once you've read it, you feel, yeah, that's that's how things needed to end. Um, uh, that that it it's kind of hard to describe. It's almost like I know it when I see it, but. Um, It's kind of a feeling of justice that this is what was deserved uh, for the characters in this situation. Um, and that they have completed what needed to be done. Um, I'm not sure quite how to explain it other than that. But uh, yeah, that, that it feels complete. Um, yeah. Yes. Is there 
just talking about any of them you could talk about like, you know, like a really good beginning, strong hook that engages the reader? Um, I think one of the keys to a good beginning is attitude. Um, <clears throat> Give us a character with attitude towards something. Um, and uh, now it's possible to write stories about characters who aren't particularly likable people. Um, it's easier to write, to engage the reader if they like a character. Um, uh, one of the stories I've had the most trouble selling is the one that has the unlikable main character. I've submitted it to like 13 or 14 markets and uh, nobody likes it. <laughs> um, now that's not to say that it won't ever sell. I've sold stories that it took, uh, yeah, the one in, uh, in here took 23 markets to sell, uh, but it sold at a professional rate, and I kept it out there because I believed in it. Um, but um, some some people will say you need a hook at the beginning, and um, it depends on what you mean by hook. Um, if it's a gimmick. That's that's not really related to the rest of the story, but you know, I'm just going to start off with explosions and something really exciting so that people that that doesn't really work um, because once you get past that, if unless you essentially keep up the interest, then what was the point of that hook? Um, uh, one of my writer friends said, I'm trying to remember exactly how he phrased it, but it was something to the effect of, um, uh, you know, don't, don't give me a hook. Uh, give me a beginning that's uh, so interesting that I don't notice there was a hook until it's halfway down my gullet. You know, um, but... Uh, Don't start off with weather reports. Uh, well, there's a, there's a big difference between short fiction and long fiction in this. Uh, short fiction, you've got a, maybe a page or two to engage the reader or you're, or you're going to lose them. They want, short fiction, you need to get them into the story right away. Uh, with novels, you often have a chapter or two to try to, to really try to engage the reader. Novel readers are willing to move at a slower pace, let you build into things more. Short fiction, you need to get into it right away. Um, uh, but show an interesting character doing an interesting thing, and your reader's going to keep reading. But doing an interesting thing like an interesting character engaged in an activity that is interesting whether whether you know uh, whether that's being done to them or they are doing it just it has to be an interesting activity um, it is it is pretty much always fatal uh, for a story to start off with a character who's bored um, and who is not almost immediately caught up into something interesting because a bored character doing boring things is not going to be interesting to the reader um, unless unless the character has a lot of attitude if the character is extremely sarcastic about the boring stuff that is going on, that can work. But then the character is being very interesting to make up for the lack of interesting stuff going on. Um, with, with pretty much any rule 
of writing, it can you can find an example where it was broken and the story still works. So. Um, Other questions? Yes. I feel like in writing and in a lot of other things, there's a, a strong barrier to entry. And when you're on the outside, you don't know how to get inside. Once you're on the inside, it seems much easier. Are yes, once you're on the tips? inside, you're no longer allowed to ta tell the secret handshake to anyone. Sorry. <laughs> okay. um, uh, well, the first thing I would recommend um, for those who um, enjoy writing short fiction um, is the Writers of the Future contest. Um, that's how I broke in. Um, once, I, once I was a Writers of the Future winner, I started getting a better class of re rejection letter. Um, <laughs> and, and I started selling uh, fairly consistently shortly thereafter. Um, uh, Brad Torgerson, who's another Utah writer, um, won Writers of the Future, uh, I think, yeah, two years ago, um, and then has sold, I think, uh, five stories to Analog in the time since, uh, won the Analog Reader's Poll for uh, his first story in Analog. He's really taken off all of a sudden after winning Writers of the Future. Um, not everyone who wins Writers, Writers of the Future goes on to, to success, but pretty much every Writers of the Future winner who keeps at it, I, I've seen them start publishing fairly consistently. Um, there are too many who kind of quit and don't, so. Um, so yeah, Writers of the Future, the, the main thing about Writers of the Future is you are competing against other people who don't have a lot of professional sales. Uh, and s Whereas if you're trying to break into the magazines, you're competing against people who have a lot of professional sales. So you have to be really stand out a lot more in the to get into the magazines. Um, what I generally recommend, and th again, this is for people who feel that they can write short fiction and enjoy it, for people who are naturally novelists, have a real problem with writing short fiction, you shouldn't force yourself to write short fiction in order to make a name for yourself that way. Uh, keep working at novels. Um, but um, what I generally recommend for people who, who enjoy writing short fiction is enter, you know, commit to enter Writers of the Future every quarter. I mean, that just requires you to write one story every three months. Um, but if you do that, um, basically there are two possible outcomes. One, uh, you'll win Writers of the Future. That's great. Uh, the second is you won't win Writers of the Future, but you'll end up with so many publications in other magazines and anthologies that you disqualify yourself from Writers of the Future. Um, that is also a good outcome. So th really there's, there's not a downside to, to doing that. Um, I, after going to Orson Scott Card's uh, literary boot camp, um, I committed to, to doing that. Um, and I didn't have to do it for very long because my first entry, other than the one I had done 10 years earlier, and gotten rejected. My first entry ended up being a published finalist. My next entry was a winner. Um, but uh, I was lucky enough that I started, my first entry was in the last quarter of one year, and the, my next entry was the first quarter of the next year. And so it, I, I really lucked out that way. But, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so Writers of the Future is, is a way to break in in short fiction. Um, with novels, basically, Brandon's experience with, you know, keep writing novels, I'm sure he's told you how many he wrote before he got one published and, and stuff like that. Uh, for, from what I've seen, that's essentially the, the key to success in 
in novels is keep writing novels um, and keep submitting them. And the other thing is keep working to improve your craft. The fact that you're in this class shows that that's something you're trying to do. Uh, and so that's the thing to do. Yeah. Uh, kind of a related question. I guess it's kind of a couple part question. Since you've been writing short stories for a long time, do you, do you still have hopes? I mean, or do you still want to write a novel? And uh, the second part of the question is, going one, is it hard to switch from one to the other? I mean, you said that there are some skills that will obviously transfer from one to the other. But if, if you only tried one, like I've only been trying uh, the novel right now, is it kind of hard to switch gears and try the other? or? Or vice versa, is it like would you find it more difficult to try to write a novel now that you're used to short fiction? Or that's uh, that's a good question. <laughs> uh, I do I do want a career as a novelist, yeah, um, because that's the only way to to make a living writing fiction is through novels. Um, as to whether it's easy to switch, I know for some people it is, and for some people it isn't. Um, so I know some people who uh, love to take a break from working on a novel and just dash off a short story, uh, just to kind of cleanse their palate, and then they can go back to working on the novel. Um, I know some people who can't focus on more than one project at a time, and if they switch focus off the novel, it's tough for them to get back into it. Um, I actually tend to be a bit that way. Um, so when I was when I was writing Unforgettable, um, it was the only thing I was working on when I wrote it. Uh, and then when I was done with it, I worked on some short stories and then went back to revise the novel. Uh, so um, so yeah, and I do think it's possible that my having written so much short fiction has made it a bit harder for me to write at novel length. Uh, one of the editors who uh, is currently interested in Unforgettable, um, his comment, I'm, I'm trying to revise it a bit for him, his comment was, it reads a lot like a short story. Um, my, I don't put a lot of descriptive detail in. In short fiction, I can get away with that because, uh, you know, because it needs to be so short, people don't expect the amount of descriptive detail that they generally expect in a novel. Um, and so because I don't put a lot of detail in, uh, that's hurt my novel writing a bit. Um, Although I didn't put a lot of descriptive detail in in the epic fantasy either, so, uh, but um, but yeah, basically with a lot of with a lot of writing advice, uh, this is a good thing to keep in mind. There are so many different types of writers that uh, something that works for one person won't necessarily work for another. Just about every writing advice book that you will read tends to uh, be written in sort of uh, this is the way to do it uh, and you must follow this way in order to do it properly. Um, and no, I, I don't agree that there is only one proper way to do it. If there were, then there would only be one book of writing advice and not a whole bunch. Um, you know, for instance, Stephen King's On Writing, it's a great book but he says that what you have to do is, after you've written your first draft, you have to cut it by 10%. Um, well, if you're Stephen King, yeah, you do. And if you write like Stephen King, yeah, you do. But if you write like me, you may need to go in and add 10% because you've left out all the descriptive details. Um, so it, you need to, what I suggest is you try different sorts of writing advice, find what works for you uh, and fi find the process that works best for you. And that may mean taking from a bunch of different people and kind of synthesizing your own method. So, um, yeah. 
Yes. Is there if you if you do just like say you start off with a story and you get some stuff published and all of that, is there any sort of danger of being stigmatized as only a short story writer and does that make it harder to get into novels as far as publishing goes? No. Uh, there's a very, very long tradition of people writing short stories and then moving to novels. In fact, the uh, the editors of the the magazines constantly complain that all of their best writers stop writing short fiction and start writing novels. Uh, and that's why they need to pick up newer writers all the time. Yes? You may have said this already, but what's the normal like word count range of like short fiction? I mean, it's probably kind of... Yeah, the... Um, the basic categories, the award categories, are based on word count. Um, short story is uh, under 7,500 <coughs> words. Uh, novelette is from 7,500 to 17,500. Novella is 17,500 to 40,000. And novel is anything above that. Now, you know, you it's very hard to sell a 40,000 word novel, but... Um, uh, but for purposes of short fiction, it's kind of tough to sell a novella. There aren't a lot of places that will take something over 17,500 words. There are still are some places, but it's kind of a tough sell. Novelettes, there are a lot more places, and then there are tons of places that will buy short stories. Now, within the short story category, there's uh, what's called flash fiction, uh, and that's generally considered from about 1,000 words down. Um, shortest story I've sold was 400 words. Um, and uh, the longest one I've sold was 11,000. Yes. Like, how did you begin finding out all of these places for publication? Because, like, right now, like, for instance, like, I would know nothing. It's like how, I mean, obviously the internet. But yes. Uh, there is a website... Uh, duotrope.com duotrope.com and raylan.com are essentially the, the two websites to go to to look for um, short fiction markets. Um, I particularly like Duotrope because it's got a, a market search engine. You can enter in what genre you're writing in, how many words it is, um, and what pay scale you're looking for, and do a search, and it'll show you all the markets that you can send it to. Um, and so, yeah, it's... Uh, uh, Raylan.com is good if you're looking for uh, little niche anthologies uh, to see what what you could possibly write if you want just to write something for a weird anthology. Um, so, other questions? <coughs> 